Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, the online audience has been here for a bit, so I think we need to start moving because we're running a bit late. Um, yeah, so I know excitement after the reception, so it would be great, though, if... Yeah, there you are, silence. <laughs> That's what I was asking for. Um, so this is the plenary, which is ending two days of feminist economics, the School of Feminist Economics, and a transition point to the conference itself. Um, so we are going to be talking today about feminist economics, debt, structural adjustment, and the climate crisis. I've got to stand here, I was told by Daniel, um, because the mic is here, so I can't really walk around. But anyway, to start with, we are going to be talking about that's feminist economics, uh, debt, and structural adjustment. It's an uh, event hosted, co-hosted by the Institute for Economic Justice, Ideas, and IFE. We have with us Jayati Ghosh, Vera Fyodor, Basani Balui, Balui, and myself, Kanchana Rwanpura. Before I start, continue, I also want to thank uh, Juhi Kassan, Danielle, Thomas, and Leroy, who's doing all the technical work. Juhi, who has been doing a lot of organization in the past few weeks. I want to acknowledge that. Uh, so I'm Kanchana Rampara. I'm a professor at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, and also a fellow at the Center for South Asian Studies um, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I've become, I've been pulled into debt justice work, partly because of, I'm originally from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's formal defaulting in April 22 kind of dragged me into this arena. This is I've become an expert by associating with the experts, and here I am therefore introducing the experts actually to talk to us today. So we have three speakers. Jayati Ghosh would be doing uh, the keynote in a sense. Uh, to quickly introduce Jayati, uh, Jayati Ghosh, she taught economics at JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi for nearly 35 years before she moved to University of Massachusetts Amherst in early 2021. She has authored or edited 20 books and almost 200 scholarly articles. I'm not going to list them here, but anyone can look at her marvelous um, um, resume and see how much how, how prolific she is and how she what she has written. Um, alongside with her academic scholarship is that she's also won several prizes, but more importantly, I think she's taken a really high profile role in kind of advocating uh, the rights of the debt justice rights of various communities. So she's been consulted by the ILO, UNDP, UNCTAD, United Nations, and right now serves on a UN high-level advisory board on economic and social affairs. Um, so in 2021, she was appointed to the WHO Council on the Economics Health for All, and I think the, it's very recently the, uh, their report came out. Um, I could go on about Jayati. She's also in, 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 oh, a tireless uh, uh, advocate for countries, including Sri Lanka, where she, she's from India, but she's been a great advocate for Sri Lanka as well. Then we have um, Basani Baloyi, uh, who is uh, the program director uh, and former climate and energy infrastructure program lead at IEG, which is in. Institute for Economic Justice. She's a feminist, development economist, and activist, and she gained her PhD from SOAS working with Ben Fine. Uh, she gained her research experience while working um, on industrial policy issues in academia, but also in um, at the Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development, uh, and Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development Unit in South Africa. She's the former Inequality program lead at Oxfam Sri Lanka, uh, South Africa. So she's kind of come, has two uh, spheres of uh, experience. And she has also had experience in movement building and coordination, coordinating, campaigning, and advocating for economic and social justice in partnership with various uh, social movements. Um, so then our third speaker is Vera Fyodor. She's an associate professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Development of Finance. She holds a PhD in management uh, from the Graduate School of Business, University of Cape Town. 
and she has handled both undergraduate and graduate level courses in finance and investment. Um, her expertise lies, one might of course ask why are we interested in finance, but it will become evident as we speak along. Her expertise lies in the areas of corporate governance, corporate finance, gender diversity, enterprise risk management, environmental and social risk management. She too is a prolific author and has authored a number of peer reviewed publications and also been consulted with a number of reputable entities, including GIS, IFC, uh, and so on, and delivered a number of cap capacity building um, projects. Um, she, Vera is currently a director and senior consultant at the Madillo, at Madillo Consultant, which is a management consulting and training firm. Her current port portfolio spans business and finance literacy, financial strategy, development and interventions. And she provides training, corporate training in the areas of finance invest and investment. Um, so Vera is also a member of the African Research Co Consortium and a visiting scholar at the IMF Washington, DC. So how come we are back to talking debt? Um, I think Diane Elson is somewhere in the audience. I hope we spoke before. We were talking about similar issues in the 1980s. Not, I mean, I've, I know only this because I've read Diane's work. So feminist economic analysis is quite critical for us to understand the enormous unraveling of impact of structural an enormous um, debt crisis that's going on, but th these are issues that have been unraveled from the 1980s with the structural adjustment policies and in the 1990s. Um, this brought to the floor, not just now, but even previously, the gendered impacts of austerity and austerity's consequences for work, livelihoods, care, access to resources, household dynamics, and social reproduction more broadly, and for, and for understanding to more fully understand feminist macroeconomic research and how it has been invaluable for understanding the relationship between austerity, privatization, marketization, and financialization, which is why Vera's contribution is quite critical here. And the connections between production and social product reproduction and the interrelationships between two, both of them. The Global South stands on the precipice of another debt crisis with a new wave of structural adjustment, although they're not calling that it's structural adjustment anymore, but certainly austerity privatization, the financialization and market regulations that are being imposed by IFIs in various ways. So Jayati Ghosh wrote this article in July, 2022 in The Guardian, pointing out that there's a global debt crisis coming and it won't stop at Sri Lanka. Uh, she spoke to a Sri Lankan audience a few days after this, um, which was a Zoom conversation. And it, it took the UNDP in November 2022, I think this, if I get this, yeah, Oct sorry, October 2022, to acknowledge that they, they, there are 53 countries that are going to be facing a debt crisis or that's coming up. The uh, and, uh, Oxfam, Oxfam analysis shows that as of 15th March 2021, 85% of the 107 COVID-19 loans negotiated between the IMF and 85 governments indicated plans to undertake austerity once the health crisis abates. And by April 2022, the update showed that 43 out of the 50, 55 African Union member states face public expenditure cuts totaling, totaling over 183 billion over the next five years. But it is not just a crisis that's limited to the African continent. This is actually far broader than that. So on top of that, the climate crisis is already being felt across the globe, which is why Basani is here. And, and so um, the 54 countries um, with severe debt problems reported by the UNDP include 20, 28 of the top 50 most climate vulnerable nations in the world. It is well understood in a sense then this multiple interlocking crises will be differentiated across cl class, race, gender, and other intersectional lines of inequalities. So this is what we are going to be hearing today. And I'm going to hand the mic, the Zoom session over to Jayati. Do I do anything technical, no? Over to you all, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanchana, for that really excellent introduction. And um, yeah, I think you've already 
highlighted the nature of this crisis. Since the UNDP wrote that, uh, produced that paper, things have got significantly worse. The IMF now estimates that there are around 72 countries in severe or moderate debt stress. Others like debt justice have said that actually there are even more who are on the verge of extreme uh, debt stress. Ar around um, half the poorest people of the world live in countries where their governments spend more on debt servicing than they do on health. So we are talking about a situation which is really, I mean, any in, in any normal circumstance would be called a crisis, uh, pretty much in developed countries if it ever happened at that, uh, it, it, at that extreme way. But as usual, what is happening is still too little too late, right? We know that it's too little too late. People have been saying, the IMF has been saying it, the World Bank has been saying, everybody's saying that it's too little too late and yet nothing happens. This is a debt crisis that is now three years old, really, for many of the, the severely indebted countries. And yet very little is changing in the global dynamics. And that's quite extraordinary. It's really happening because of the fact that the countries that are facing these sovereign debt crises are not seen by global finance as being systemically important. And that's why uh, the debt restructuring process has taken forever. That's why these debt uh, uh, nations are forced to go individually and negotiate with a whole multiplicity of different creditors and why they are held responsible if agreements are not reached and why the creditors can continue to squabble among themselves and delay any process of genuine restructuring because they are not seen as systemically important, which is to say that they will not um, fundamentally threaten global capitalism. And that's very different from, let's say, relatively small institutions with much uh, you know, less, you would think, significant amounts of debt. For example, the Silicon Valley Bank, which uh, had a major crisis, as some of you probably know, in March. And then the US Federal Reserve rushed, OK, over the weekend. It, it worked out a package, and it basically did everything it could, whatever it takes, to somehow resolve the problem. We saw in Switzerland that when Credit Suisse faced difficulties, once again, the Swiss authorities over a few days managed some kind of a resolution, which of course involved merging Credit Suisse with its other major partner, the UBS in Switzerland. But the point is that they did this with extreme rapidity, extreme flexibility, and breaking the rules that they themselves had established about what they would allow banks to do and how they would protect banks. They broke all those rules. So when they decide it's important, they can do it. They haven't done it. Now, why haven't they done it? Let's come to that. And what are the implications of it not happening? First, I just want to highlight why is it there are so many countries in debt suddenly? Why is it, you know, this we saw, we have seen waves of debt crisis, as Kanchana was mentioning, you know, the 1980s, the Latin American debt crisis, the, the 1990s, there were about 92 debt crises that the IMF counted. So we've seen waves of debt crises. This particular one comes after a period when, in fact, low in, lower income countries, uh, we used to call them emerging markets, why emerging? Because they're getting integrated into global capital markets. And then we had frontier markets, which are the markets that earlier no private creditors would touch with a barge pool, but now suddenly they were also available to access credit. So lower income countries over the period really since 2010 have been experiencing access to global capital markets in a way that they didn't get before. And that's really because after the global financial crisis, uh, the very easy monetary policies of the rich countries provided massive cheap liquidity to all these banks and to lots and lots of other financial institutions. And so there's all this money sloshing around the globe looking for places to invest. So part of the reason, the original sin, if you like, of this, the current debt crisis is the fact that these lower income countries were encouraged and there was really a cheerleading process on to get into global capital markets, access 
relatively cheap money from whatever source was available, and many of them were private. So they were allowed to issue bonds. We have bondholders, BlackRock, Blackstone, et cetera, now some of the biggest creditors to these countries. So this was part of a process that the IMF, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, everybody was very happy about. Now, these are countries that are seen as inherently more risky for various reasons. And which means that when they get this debt, yes, it's cheap compared to what they got before, but it's much more expensive than the debt that anyone in a rich country would access, whether an individual, a private company, a, a government, okay? You pay a risk premium. So countries like Sri Lanka, like Ghana, like Zambia, like all of the other countries, Senegal currently facing debt crisis, accessed cheaper debt, but they accessed it at still higher rates than other countries, the richer countries. And so they were actually paying, the interest that they have been paying is already significantly higher precisely because of this risk premium. Nonetheless, at the first sign of anything difficult, at any possibility of difficulties in repayment, this is when they find that suddenly the capital dries up. And of course, we know what happened. We had the COVID-19 pandemic, which dried up export receipts and dried up tourism receipts and remittances, and it affected most developing countries very, very badly. And this in turn meant that they had less foreign exchange receipts, the slowdown in economic activity, the fact that they could not spend more in terms of fiscal expansion than other countries. So all of this meant that they were very badly affected. And we find capital drying up for these countries. And it's really that which has driven us to this precipice of major debt crises. What I'm trying to say is that yes, in all of the debtor countries, there were individual factors responsible, but in fact, there was one common thread in all of them, and that was the global tendencies and processes that were getting them into debt. Since then, we have had very little. We have had mostly re uh, not restructuring, that is reduction of debt, but mostly just pushing the can down the road, rescheduling. Even the latest debt relief of Zambia is essentially just a rescheduling. It doesn't reduce the value of the debt. And those countries that have managed to reduce the debt, it's been at, with a lot of blood, sweat and tears that you manage to get a very tiny reduction in the debt. The real problem with that is that it doesn't create the fiscal space that you need. The whole idea of a debt reduction, a jubilee there used to be, right? There was the whole biblical notion of a jubilee every 20 years because you realize that debts cannot be sustained beyond a point. The idea is to provide these governments fiscal space to grow out of their problem. You reduce some of that debt so that countries can grow, okay? Now, in fact, that's not happening, yeah? There's very little in terms of the different agreements, but also the agreements themselves take no account of the other massive stresses facing all of these debtor countries. Kanchana referred to it, the fact of climate change. That in fact, these are countries, many of them have had recent shocks like Pakistan. Some of them have, are in ongoing climate crisis like Bangladesh. Many of the countries in Africa, the debtor countries in Africa are facing major problems in terms of crop productivity, losses, and new pests emerging again because of climate change. All of this is not factored in, either in terms of dealing with the debt on a priority basis or in terms of the conditions that are attached to the debt restructuring. So this is where I'm coming now to the point about how we're dealing with it. First of all, we're dealing in a broader sense, we're not dealing with it. We're pretending it's not there, we're pretending it's, it'll go away on its own or basically, the rich countries are saying, fundamentally, we don't care that much. That's really, in a way, that's hap what's happening. But we also know that the ways in which this, these debt relief packages are sought to be imposed are deeply, I won't say gender blind, they're deeply gender exploitative. It's not that they are blind about the differences uh, across gender. They are exploiting the fact that the gender, gender construction of societies means that women are, uh, are affected in different ways and are forced to respond in different ways to packages of adjustment and packages that provide some debt relief. And so 
let's think about the different ways in which women interact with the economy. Yes, as paid workers for sure, but typically as paid workers at the bottom of the wage spectrum and in more fragile employment, more vulnerable employment. As self-employed workers, once again, the most vulnerable of all, the ones and among self-employed workers, women much less favored than men because they typically don't have access to any kinds of property titles. They don't have access to credit. They don't get the same kinds of assistance from government programs and so on and so forth. Women as migrant workers, once again, huge importance of remittances in many developing countries. And yet it's not, it's not factored in to the ways in which they need to be protected in periods of crisis. Women are responsible typically for provisioning for households. They're the ones who have to make sure that people get enough to eat, that the kids can manage to get basic nutrition and go to school, that people uh, get minimal health care and so on and so forth. And so all the factors that affect the ability of the household to provide for itself, women tend to be more responsible for it. And of course, women are unpaid workers, not only in the biological reproduction, of which is massive, but also in all of the other aspects of social reproduction, the direct and indirect care, the extended care activities, which are essential for societies to continue. Now, what tends to happen is that the condition, the packages associated with debt relief, either directly or indirectly impact women by affecting each of these aspects of their lives. And they do this sometimes directly through austerity measures. There are still, by the way, a lot of austerity measures going on imposed by the IMF, even in the period since the pandemic. Around nine countries, including Nigeria and Angola, have been are, uh, doing, uh, being told to, 14 countries, sorry, are being told to freeze or cut public sector wages and jobs. And that obviously affects healthcare, that affects a whole lot of other things. In Ecuador, the IMF asked for a reversal of increases in healthcare spending and in, even stopped cash transfers for people unable to work. In Nigeria and Angola, it was actually the tax regime that was affected. That is to introduce or increase the collection of value added taxes, which we know are regressive. And what does that do? It increases the costs of basic goods. And since women are responsible for provisioning and women tend to self-deny, women and girls tend to get less when there is less for the household as a whole, that has a strong gender impact as well. But increasingly because of the criticisms that have been leveled at austerity, we find that the recent IMF packages do not talk about austerity. They do not mention the word austerity. They may ask for cuts in public spending, but they couch it much more carefully. Increasingly, it's an even more pernicious tendency. Before you even get to sign the program, you have to do a whole lot, lot of things. So Sri Lanka went through a whole lot of things even before it actually signed the program. Pakistan is jumping through hoops, fulfilling all kinds of, I would argue, atrocious conditions, okay? In order to be able to sign, to get the, the last two tranches of an existing IMF program. Bangladesh, it's opaque because, of course, none of this comes out. It's all implicit within the governments and so on. But again, made to undergo a range of privatizations and reductions of particular types of public provision in order to get access to an IMF program. So, for example, in Pakistan, now remember, Pakistan is a country where it recently had a, a flood, climate-related flood, okay, with $30 billion worth of losses. Yet, none of this is factored in when you are offering 2.1 billion as an additional amount of relief from the IMF and no attempt to reduce other debt. What are they being asked to do? They're asked to uh, impose electricity charges on the poorest population for whom the minimum base electricity was being provided. Now, this actually has huge gender implications. When electricity is expensive, when there is darkness in villages, in shops, in schools, in homes, it's women are unsafe. Women find it more difficult to do a whole range of things. I, uh, electricity is of course a huge human rights issue, but it is also something with very, very specific gender implications. Okay, so we all know what lighting does and what it means for let us say women's girls access to mobility, schooling, et cetera, et cetera. They have asked for exchange rate devaluations 
Now, in a food importing country, you ask, ask for an exchange rate devaluation. What does that do? It obviously increases the price of food. It increases the price of fuel. If you are an oil importing country, and this is exactly what's happening in Sri Lanka at the moment. And then they say, oh, there's so much inflation. It's inflation because a lot of it is imported and your devaluations are making it worse. So they say, oh, there's inflation. So let's have tighter monetary policy, raise the interest rates. All of these have gender impact. Of course, the food impact, it's obvious, but the fuel impact is obvious as well because fuel enters into all other prices. So it has the same impact as a high VAT. It's an indirect tax kind of a squeeze, okay? At the same time, higher fuel costs then feed into transport costs. And once again, we know that when transport becomes more expensive, it's women and girls who tend to be denied the mobility. So higher interest rates in turn make it much more difficult for women to access loans, for small enterprises that hire women to function or continue to survive, and for self-employed women to be able to survive as well. In recently, in Sri Lanka, another thing has happened, which is that the external debt is sought to be restructured, the debt that's held by foreigners. And because of IMF insistence, the Sri Lankan government has now agreed that they will also restructure the domestic debt, which is to say debt held in Sri Lankan rupees. Now that's ridiculous. There's no need to do that. No country does that because you can always print your own money to repay. Why should you restructure that debt? And who, who loses when you restructure that debt? Well, it turns out they're not going to restructure the debt of the banks, which will affect elite incomes. They will restructure the debt held by pensions, pension funds, poor people and working people who have been working all their lives, they will be hit. They will face an absolute loss in income. I could go on and on. There are many, many examples. But the problem really is that despite all of the talk of you know, gender balance and despite the fact that you know, the IMF and the World Bank now have gender divisions and they have very aware leadership, they have women leaders who are aware of all these issues and who speak very well about these issues. Despite all of that, the programming has not just not changed, it's possibly got even worse. And it's just become a little bit more hypo hypocritical. What you get now are, specific women-oriented schemes, you know, as a sign that, oh, look, we're gender aware. So yes, you do, we're gonna do all this other stuff, but then we're gonna do a, a scheme specifically for women and girls. And we're going to tell you that you have to put some money into the scheme as a condition. Now, this is meaningless. These schemes can do nothing in the face of this other terrific onslaught that is coming in the face of this, all of that package of adjustment and austerity and, pseudo austerity, whatever you want to call it, which is not given its real name. So the problem really is that our international institutions still remain deeply gender exploitative. And I repeat this point, the debt strategies are not gender blind. They are based on the recognition that essential work for the economy will still be done in worse conditions with less pay or more unpaid work because of the gender imbalances and, and the gender constructions of societies. I could say a lot more. And I could, we could also talk about the kinds of progressive policies that are possible, which are available, which are easy to do, and yet somehow do not get considered, whether it is taxing the rich, taxing illicit financial flows, taxing extreme wealth, taxing obscene consumption, carbon emitting consumptions of the very rich, taxing multinational corporations who currently just shift their profits to low tax jurisdictions. All of this can be done. It's known how it can be done, and yet it's not considered. So I think, I mean, I often wonder what we can do to make a difference, but I think at least we have to make a really loud noise about all of this. As feminist economists, we have to recognize that debt is a deeply feminist issue. The debt relief is currently a deeply patriarchal issue. And we have to make enough noise about that to actually cause some kind of change. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jati. Brilliant as always. Um, 
debt is a deeply feminist issue, debt relief is a de deeply patriarchal issue, something to consider and talk through. So next we have Basani, are you gonna come here or are you gonna sit there? You're gonna be there? Okay, so Basani is next. She has about 10, 12 minutes and then Vera. Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to speak about how the current climate finance uh, terrain, um, you know, what are its implications, right, on the global financial architecture? What does it say about the current, uh, the structural issues uh, within the, the global financial architecture? So the big ask or the big demand is that one trillion US dollars per year is required to maintain uh, the 1.5 degree uh, pathway, right? That's a big number, uh, uh, obviously. And, and the pledge uh, that was made uh, in COP15 in 2009 in Copenhagen was that um, there would be the, be the mobilization of 100 billion uh, US dollars um, sorry, did I say one trillion rand? I meant one trillion US dollars. But um, that there would be the mobilization of 100 billion US dollars per year that would be dispersed to developing countries coming from uh, developing, uh, developed countries, right? Who obviously contributed to climate change. But the fail is that uh, this pledge has not actually been realized, right? Uh, since this, it was made in, in, in 2009. And the reason that's been given uh, by the architects of the global financial architecture is, as you've heard, there is no fiscal space. There's simply no fiscal space. Uh, and even when there was, in fact. Uh, uh, and number two is that there are trillions uh, of, of dollars in private finance that are sitting there untapped. They're just there, waiting. Waiting for a bankable project, waiting for some profitable uh, uh, project uh, to, to funnel the money in. But they are scared. They are scared because it's risky. They don't quite know how to price the things that are out there, right? And so in order for these, this, this flood of money that is sitting there, in order for it to be unleashed to the world that needs it, to the people that need it, we need to de-risk it. Let's de-risk it. So now, what is this de-risking thing? There, there are three uh, ingredients to de-risking that the global financial architecture has come with, up with. The first is public money. The second is innovative financing instruments. And the third is an enabling environment. So in terms of uh, the, the public money, right? The idea is that we need to mobilize the billions of public money in order to leverage that so that the trillions of private finance can then come out. That's the whole idea, okay. And, uh, and the idea is that you need innovative financing instruments to realize this thing. Now, what are these innovative financing instruments? The one is blended finance, which Simply put, is about combining public money and private finance, right? Public concessional, uh, concessional loans, uh, debt, right? I mean, sorry, concessional loans and grants, right? And, and combining that with private finance. And that's what blending finance is. But actually, when you look at what this thing is, is the fact that the presence of public money in this whole mix 
allows you to cheap, uh, makes the private finance, which is far more costlier, cheaper, right? Because what it actually is, is a subsidy to the private financiers. That's what it is, right? Uh, so, so we're going to blend this finance. And then what we're going to do, we're going to have public-private partnerships, which are basically simply put a procurement strategy that is about privatizing public goods, essentially, right? In a way, but you do it in a way that limits the risk exposure to private, the private sector and transferring it back to the state, back to the populace, through a range of contracting innovations, through a range of, uh, yeah, through a range of protections. And those protections are provided by an enabling environment, right? An enabling environment that basically guarantees the revenue generation that is to come from a particular good or service whether it be in energy, in transport, or whatever, guarantees them for 30, 40 years. 30, 40 years, you will get that revenue. No matter what comes, no matter if there is climate change and it impacts the infrastructure, no matter if there is a debt crisis, and then it means that you can't actually generate the revenue from that particular infrastructure, you still have to pay that debt service as it was, because we need this money guaranteed, as we had said it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, doesn't matter, right? So that's what an enabling environment is. Therefore, the, the climate finance terrain tells us a number of things about the structural issues within the global financial architecture. And I'll talk about four. The first is the scale of finance, right? Uh, the second I'll talk about is the role of the state. And the third is the economic agenda that is actually at play. And the fourth is around who's actually being risked here, de-risked here. So about the, the question of scale, um, what we've argued is that the current global financial architecture uh, will indeed fail to reach its target, right? And Kedward Gabor and Ryland Collins uh, came up with an excellent critique that basically says why this is the case. And they argue that um, the global financial architecture, its core feature is a risk-based prudential macroeconomic framework that basically systematically undermines the structural impediments uh, that continue the financing of dirty, uh, that, that continue dirty financing, right? And that deter green financing. There are a range of structural impediments, right? Uh, that continue this. One of which is the fact that, uh, you know, the global financial architecture is highly unregulated. We have shadow banks, we have private equity that have a whole range of financial instruments that go, uh, that, that basically are enabled to, to finance dirty industries, even though they are uh, 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 taxonomies or, or, or rules that say, no, you actually should be investing in green. But you can use off-balance off sheet financing to continue your financing of, of, of dirty sectors, right? So it, it actually doesn't matter uh, because what you have are, are institutional or, or financial institutions that, are, that have a carbon bias, right? And in fact, what they are responding to is the, is, is the question of incumbency, the question of the fact that you have dirty uh, uh, fossil fuel industries that are incumbents, that are, you know, that are highly profitable, right? 
that have high revenue uh, um, uh, stream, okay? And they don't care for uh, green financing where the innovations are still things that are under development. They, they are still in their infancy, okay? But that's not gonna guarantee them the profits that they want, right? Um, and of course, the fossil fuel industry has benefited from a lot of subsidies to get to where they are, it, they, uh, it is. But critically, they are going to milk that cow. They are going to milk that cow. And so what we are doing is we are entrusting the pace of our transition uh, to the dictates of financial speculation, to the dictates of a volatile, uh, 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 unregulated financing space, right? Uh, that doesn't have the patience for the types of technologies that are actually required for us to transition. And then of course, there is the carbon bias that is inherent in our monetary policy across the world. It's a, it's a monetary policy that to, ha, has not broadened its mandate to include issues of environmental justice within it. And so what do you do here is that you, 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 you know, you, you have a whole set of instruments. Let's take in, uh, interest rates, where, which can be adjusted accordingly to penalize, right? Um, uh, where you, you basically penalize dirty industries through the use of interest rates, or you penalize dirty industries through the use of how much capital that uh, uh, banks are required to have, right? Um, uh, so there are a range of in monetary instruments that are not actually being put into play that are, are required that then create this carbon bias. So even if you are de-risking, right? Your, the structure of your economy hasn't really changed. Your, the structure of your macroeconomic uh, economic, uh, framework uh, hasn't really changed. So as a result of which, we will continue not to mobilize the financing that is required. Now, what does this say about the state? So, what we have is a state that is not about, that is not about a, like a green developmental state, right? That supports a just energy transition, that supports a, 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 a green new deal. What we have is a de-risking state that is about supporting private profiteering. And and a state that is being instrumentalized by capital to transfer the risk back onto society. That's the kind of state that we have. Now, what does it say about the economic agenda that we have? Well, it says that the economic agenda that we have is actually a green structural adjustment, right? Which has a number of features, which is the commodification of public goods, right? The commodification of the, the provision of renewable or clean uh, uh, energy technology through public-private partnerships that then creates inequalities of access. In many parts of the, our, in our continent, like half of the populace just does not have access to electricity. In this country where you know, our access rates are quite high. The question is not about access as much, but it's also about affordability. What, does, what happens when we privatize our electricity system? That has social reproductive uh, 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 consequences, just as JRT spoke about. She spoke about the issues of safety. There's also the issues of now, uh, returning to the use of biomass, dirty fuels that are highly unsafe, and who is actually going out to collect the wood? It's the women, it's the girls. 
And another feature of this is the flow of finance, right? The flow of finance is going to a narrow set of techno fixes, right? 92% of our finance, of, of climate financing goes to mitigation, not to adaptation, not to re resilience. And this is serious because in our continent, many countries don't actually contribute to emissions, but they face the biggest impact of climate change. However, there's nothing going to the private sector. That's not an area that they've thought about how to profit from, right? So much of the financing is actually grant funding, public funding, and it's very small. But we are, they, we are thinking that there are these trillions that are sitting there. And of course, again, these trillions are like in terms of what they want to finance is very narrow, right? So what does, what does that actually mean in terms of how we build back better? How do we get a transformative ad like adaptation plan that is around uh, uh, trans transforming the, the very social and e economic systems that actually created uh, the current crisis? And then the fourth area, uh, um, or the fourth implication of this is the fiscal and regulatory risks that are associated with this, with this kind of uh, global financial architecture that is, that is inherent in the climate finance. The first is the fact that the kind of, uh, much of this financing is through debt, private finance, very expensive, right? Even though we are de-risking it, it's still very expensive. And how uh, JRT just spoke about the fact that, you know, there is no formal sovereign, um, sovereign insolvency process currently, because we know when we mobilize all this funding through debt, right, there will be some kind of debt distress at some point because climate change, because any kind of like a shift, right? Uh, in uh, the monetary policy of the U.S. has an impact, right, in what happens uh, in various developing countries. And so you are pumping money. You are saying that you're going to pump all this money and you're going to encourage this debt, private finance, and steer it towards uh, the climate response but within a global financial architecture where we don't have a formal sovereign, sovereign insolvency, right? So my time to wrap up. No, I'm sorry. Uh, and then there are other, <laughs> other types uh, of uh, the, the, uh, regulatory costs where, you know, um, as I mentioned, during the a lot of these public-private partnerships, they force countries to take on um, contracting that can be up to 40 years where, you're, where there's guaranteed financing. And, but if, there is a, if there's a crisis that happens during the course of this, right, and there is a need for you to change your regulatory environment, and this happened in, in, in Europe, right, when there was a, a, um, a sovereign debt crisis, a lot of the re renewable projects just couldn't, could, like there was a, there's a, there was a change, uh, there was a removal of subsidies in order to, to restructure the debt. There were 80 companies that basically sued the countries of Spain, Czech Republic and, and others for changing the, regula the regulations because they could not get the, the guaranteed um, uh, revenues that they had expected as per contract. And they could, they were emboldened to. Why? Because the, this enabling environment allows them to. It basically says that you can go on to international arbitration and declare your money back. It basically says that um, if you leave the contract, if the country leaves the contract, then it has to pay back the, 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 the company the balance that is due. And if that if that project has been in operation 
for five years and it's a 30 year contract, then it has to pay whatever the revenues it would have earned over the 25 year period. That is billions, right? Uh, which has a lot of implications. Okay, I'll stop there. Sorry, I've been pushed, but thank you for your time. Thanks, Basani. Uh, so next we have Vera Fyodor from University of Ghana. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, for me, the ask is to look at Ghana, which has become a typical case study right now. We, uh, um, we become the hottest cake because we seem to have so many problems now. And so the question is, where is Ghana now in terms of its debt issues? How did we get here? Potential issues about the way forward, whether they are any governance issues that may be related to the IFIs, that's the international financial institutions, and whether uh, there are any fiscal monetary policy uh, intersectionalities we can talk about. So speaking to the question of how did we get here? So Ghana, it's a relatively small country as of the last census, we are averaging about 35 million people, most of them being very useful. So yes, production wise. But as a country, we've typically had mostly a current account deficit. Mm -hmm. And in terms of tax efficiency, I think we are actually one of the lowest in terms of ability to pull up um, revenue in terms of taxes. Mm -hmm. Also because the economy is mostly underpinned by an informal sector. And it seems government of the government has struggled to rope in the informal sector. So that means that our ability to collect on taxes to fund our budgets has been a problem and that has actually given birth to this issue of taking on debt after debt after debt and of course um the whole should i say beauty of being allowed onto the international financial market did somehow play an alluring you know tease and then we ended up borrowing excessively and as of the last check we had crossed over 80% to GDP in terms of debt. And then we are spending all the money that we raise in terms of taxes. If you have to look at the debt service to revenue, it's everything goes. Now, what makes it even more critical is the fact that over the years, it seems we have borrowed mostly to fund consumption expenditures, so wages or salaries, uh, social interventions that we've gone on or rolled out. And so what has actually, so that has been the fact that a very minimal spending in terms of the capital side, which then means that the return on investment has been literally non-existent. Coupled with the fact that in the recent past, barely two to three years ago, we've had to undertake a financial sector cleanup. May I add that the financial market in Ghana is mostly bank dependent. And so at a point when it was clear that the gains we have made in terms of financial sector deepening was going to be affected by the collapse of a lot of weak banking sector players, the government stepped in through the central bank to clean up and sort of provide some cushioning. And that also resulted in some massive debt um, accrual. So put all of that together, we literally tipped over the edge. This has also not been held by the fact that um, we are mostly import dependent. And then we have the case where um, our CD begins to deteriorate very fast. We seem not to produce that much actually. So then the revenue sources in terms of um, export revenue is literally next to nothing. Now, what actually compounds the issue for Ghana currently is the fact that most of our exports are primary in nature. And, and it's funny, um, I'm, I'm for the past how many years since I sort of got into the field of academia, we hear the case of, and we have to do value addition, and we have to do value addition. And strangely, most of our interventions where that, wherever they come from, for some reason, does not seem to tackle the issue of the value addition. Now, even as the financial sector cleanup has gone on, and then with that debt that has accrued, 
which has now resulted in the country running back to the IMF, which has then come with, you know, like Jayati said, polished austerity measures, part of which we've had the case where taxes have suddenly, uh, you know, flown through the roof. We have um, the latest, one of the key ones that started the heat was the fact that we went on an e-levy drive, which was an electronic levy and it was uh, targeted at the mobile money. Now, unfortunately, like she said, um, the mobile money is something that is, should I say, more of the preserve of the financially excluded. And that's how they became financially included. And these are the those quite low at the bottom of the pyramid. And so with this taxation that has hit the mobile money framework, what it means is that it worsens the issue of the poverty. Then with the debt restructure, because Ghana is looking to restructure um, about 10.5 million billion, sorry, of uh, debt over the next three years. Also because most of our banking institutions have significant exposure to government's public debt. And so what is really happening is that as the haircuts are running through, it's actually beginning to almost shake up the banks that were literally restructured no more than some three years ago. And quite a number of them are seriously putting up layoffs. And so with the layoffs means that we're going to even have, um, you know, um, unemployment issues. Secondly, because now they also have liquidity issues and not for also because um, individuals through other pension funds, because they were targeting the pension funds, that literally ended up with a, a stalemate with the government because organized labor threatened that should government touch the pensions, they were going to literally lay down their tools. It's still going back and forth. One moment they come with a new package to offer us and then the stalemate is still running. But one of the things that seems to be emerging, and before we left, um, you'd realize that with this glitch that is happening within the financial sector, one, the banks have no money to give, and the little they have because of the deteriorated financial conditions in the economy, they are now charging very exorbitant interest rates. Interest rates are now averaging around 40 plus percent. What that means is that private sector, which is even then supposed to help governments to keep the economy running, provide employment, because in the private sector provides as much as 70% of employment outside of the public sector. Now, most businesses are collapsing, which then even, you know, sort of compounds the already existing tax inefficiency, because now without production, it means taxation becomes a bigger problem. And then the cycle continues and continues. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting one. And the question you then begin to ask yourself, how are we going to get out of this rut? Because with all the um, offers that appear to be on the table, Ghana seems to have um, a very tough journey ahead. Currently, we are not too sure what the reform plan is. Um, our Minister of Finance uh, is still, I believe, scratching his head and trying to put his team together to come up with the right solution. But clearly, um, there's got to be something that's got to give. And maybe like Jayati said, maybe if we were important enough, <laughs> maybe then somebody is going to stop and say, how do we lift this one and try to resurrect it? But as it stands, I think uh, before we left, one of the key things that it seems to be emerging, if you look at our investment promotion framework, there was a clause in there that made it sort of a bit more difficult for large multinationals to come in and, you know, take over the relatively green and young market. That meant that you needed to come in with a certain minimum level of capital before you could play in. Um, as of the last um, engagement we were having in some meetings, it appears that that's one of the clauses that needs to go. What it means is that when those clauses leave, even the small businesses that provide employment, that, you know, protects the economy, they're likely to go off. 
And when they do, that could have serious implications because that's where most of the women are employed. They provide those kind of interventions. And so what we begin to look at now is that um, Ghana that was once the beacon and whatnot has, um, should I call it, a very tough job ahead. We are looking for interventions, um, looking to, how do I call it, make a, a move into growing the economy. But so far, it looks like every move, uh, it's not going to yield that much yet. But more importantly, it's to look at the fact that how do we restructure an economy that has almost most of its money going back to service debt goes to the and then we are paying so much and of course the rating agencies um the outlooks and whatnot it also didn't help much um one of the recent ones has been the fact that uh, for the accusation about the fact that there were some biases in the um, assessment that also didn't help with our play on the international financial market but as we speak access to that market is also closed for the meantime what it means is that we can only work and the cycle has become a bit more vicious within and so companies to a large extent most are closing defaulting on their loans the the it, the outlook doesn't look that great but like it said um short of defaulting on most of our loans ghana is now a unique case study that requires most economists to look at it from so many angles to find out what the solution is. I think even as you're actually speaking, was speaking, one of the key things that maybe we may want to go back and look at is the fact that yes, when you take Ghana, we have uh, more than 50% of the population being women. And so then we begin to look at, maybe we need to start narrowing down and looking at the implications, the significant implications that this holds for women in particular, because if you have, your economy more you know more than 50 percent being women and then you have to take these austerity measures it's about time we actually just expanded the lenses a bit to find out what exactly are the implications what do we do about them how do we fix them to ensure that in the long run we don't actually collapse as a state because then that that would hold some very dire consequences but yeah in terms of that, what else there is to add on is the fact that one of the key things we have come to, um, if you look at the IFI governance, I think because most of the board members for these financial institutions, these multilateral institutions that support World Bank, et cetera, are driven more by membership and like constituents, it becomes a bit more interesting. I work in the area of governance, of course, the typical governance, you're looking at independence and the fact that it's fiduciary to the institution. But here we have the board members typically straddling two roles. First, as representatives of their members and then also having that fiduciary role. And I think that seems to be some tension that is playing out that we are yet to find out how that could be harnessed for the benefits of the party. So, is the interest to grow the World Bank or the interest to grow the nations and whose, who's, um, should I say, needs or wants become the order of the day. And for now, I think the countries in distress are not yet the ones who are the top of the game. And maybe it's about time the discussion went to find out how to make these countries important enough for someone to stop and say, how do we fix this problem? I'll rest my case here for now. Thank you. Um, so thanks, uh, Vera, Basani, and Jayati. Do we, do we see Jayati on screen again? Thanks. Um, actually, I can't really see her, but... Um, so we are running up... Well, we started a bit late, and therefore, but we actually more or less keeping time if we consider the 10 minute delayed start, but in the interest of Juhi might say we got to stop at eight o'clock. So without me kind of adding any prompts, I would open the floor for questions to anyone who wants to ask any questions, say something more, and otherwise I could start off the conversation. But let me first uh, 
yeah put the open the floor to anyone who has any burning questions or any kind of clarifications yeah um, i think there's a mic uh there's a mic or linda and perhaps it might it might be good to just quickly like in, say your name so that everyone here knows we have the future of IFE here and introduce ourselves the all these now um so yeah. i'm linda Pickborn and um I'm originally from Ghana as well, so the presentation on Ghana was was uh, particularly of interest to me because I grew up during the same era of the, you know, structural adjustment version one. Um, and I guess my question is: Is anybody drawing the links between that the failures of adjustments in the 80s and 90s in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, probably to the situation that these countries find themselves in today? I mean, just for example. You know, you mentioned continuing dependence on uh, commodity exports. You mentioned um, an inability to generate enough production, um, you know, in manufacturing, for example. Um, you know, and all of that, I, I would say, seems to have links to the kinds of policies that were implemented during the adjustment era. So I'm just curious if anybody is drawing, you know, some connections to those to those failures. Um, and then the second question was whether there's a possibility for indebted countries um, to form some kind of coalition, you know, in their negotiations with IFIs um, and with their creditors, you know, so that we don't see the kinds of, you know, outcomes that we're talking about here. So perhaps I, I'll pick about three questions and then let, open it up um, over there. Over there, I think. Okay. Over yeah. there. There we go. Hi, my name is um, Tokozile Madonka. I'm with the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. And mine is really just a, a, a kind of comment to the panel, which was great. Thank you so much. And I was just thinking that there's sort of, you've painted a picture of kind of two tensions. So the one is we're needing to make this uh, green transition or an, an adjust transition, an equitable transition, taking into consideration what this transition would look like for uh, men and women and women in particular. And at the same time, um, Professor Gosh said um, that the sort of structural adjustment or the green structural adjustment, I think Basani, you said, is not gender blind and that it's dependent on, on women and on women and girls' bodies to almost finance in multiple ways um, these debt, the debt crisis. So I'm curious to kind of um, hear from you what a, what a transformative adaptation plan could be. What could it look like? Um, and I know we've been saying they're not calling it austerity, but I mean, here we talk about, in South Africa, we talk about fiscal consolidation and it's an absolute bloodbath on social services. Um, we're doing a self, inflicted structural adjustment um, uh, program in some respects. And this is off the backs of women and, and, and girls in particular. Thanks. Um, and yeah, in front here, someone with the mic will have to move on. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much uh, for all the fantastic and uh, very sobering presentations. So Tell us your name. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> that's the next thing. Uh, my name is Nyambura from Kenya. I'm part of the African Eco Feminist Collective. So my question in general to the speakers, but also to all of us in the space. I mean, Basani, you speak very, you know, very clearly about, you know, what we're seeing right now with uh, the techno fixes, which is basically false solutions to the climate crisis, how they are furthering the debt crisis that we have in the global south. So, I mean, and of course, uh, Professor Jati Gosh speaks very clearly about the long histories of how we find ourselves uh, in the de present debt crisis and especially the last three years. But then my question is, what do we do with regard to organizing? and frontline organizing. And specifically what you talk about, uh, Basani, with regard to techno fixes, with regard to the false solutions coming out of the climate space, we have seen the impacts of carbon markets and these kinds of financing mechanisms on the lives of indigenous peoples on this continent, um, the lives of women, 
the lives of farmers, peasant farmers, uh, fisher folk, and what it actually means. So what is it, how do we actually move from, not just move from, because they're already frontline communities organizing and resisting um, the debt crisis, resisting false solutions to the climate crisis, resisting capitalism, because we have to name the system. It's not just something that falls out of the sky. So what are the possibilities of transnational, transversal uh, feminist organizing around the climate crisis, around the debt crisis, organizing against uh, patriarchy? Because it sort of feels like we've sort of forgotten the possibilities of broad-based, mass-based uh, mass movements, because without that, I'm not sure that we are actually going to be able to come out of uh, this crisis? Thank you. Brilliant question at the end. I think I think Jati answered this somewhat a few days or weeks ago, Ditters of the World Unite, cheesy title. Um, but yeah, I will hand it over to the panelists to answer. Uh, and if there are any questions from the uh, Zoom audience, I'll quickly go up and take a look. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go Vera, Basani, Jati. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I think the question about whether we anyone is mapping out the connections between the failures. Well, as we speak currently, I haven't yet come across any, but I think it's a very interesting perspective that has been raised. Maybe so then the question is structural adjustment programs we've had all over the years. What, what lessons are there to be learned? And so maybe begin to try putting them together, finding out whether they've been um, maybe policy failures that we may have ignored, but keep on, you know, implementing with different names. Like Jati said, now we will no longer mention the word austerity because yes, it's not something everybody wants to hear anymore, but we've been at a different name. So maybe if we go back and uh, maybe put the magnifying glass on the issues, we may begin to find out that maybe we've been repeating the same cycle over and over and over again and not making progress. So I think that's it's a very good piece. It might end up becoming something we'd want to research further into because clearly um, we need solutions because we've gone back cycles from the 80s and now we've done 40 years. For Ghana in particular, I think uh, this is about the 17th time we've gone to the IMF. That literally means we've gone to the IMF given since independence. We've done once every four years. That's more like a, if we were to give it our election cycle, it means every election cycle we go back to the IMF. And, and that's not something we should take serious. We, we like we should just ignore because that, that's something. So maybe, like you rightly said, we'll go back and begin to draw the lines, the connections, and begin to see what we've been failing to see so that once we get that trigger button right, we may just be on the path to proper recovery and not something that is more of just some um, paint washing here and there. Um, in terms of forming a coalition, as one suggested, maybe, but of course we'll have to look at the modalities of that. Maybe if we form a coalition and we become big enough, maybe then we'll get into the realm of being too big to be allowed to fail. And so maybe then we may become interesting to look at. So I'm I'm thinking, um, at this point, I can't put a finger on it as to how we're going to do it, given that some of these um, debt facilities actually belong to private um, yes, institutions. And so, of course, with the private sector, the focus is mostly on profit. And so as to whether they'll be ready to let go, that's another story we would want to look at. But I, I think that that's what I can say for now. Uh, for Ghana, these things are critical because um, it has actually started affecting investor confidence. And once that happens, it means that the economy itself, which relies on financing being available, which literally also is working on investors being confident in the markets to make their finances available to fund uh, business, uh, is, is, is being uh, threatened. I think these things, we would want to look at them critically and see what we can glean for the way forward. Yeah. My thoughts. Thanks. Thanks. Go ahead, Basan. Yeah, and maybe Jati. Oh, Jati has disappeared from our screen again. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to also just take up the issue of data coordination because I think it's absolutely crucial, Linda. I'm so glad you asked that because I do feel more and more that data countries should at least begin by sharing information. I find that, I mean, in my interactions with some people in different data countries, and you will possibly know more about this, is that, you know, you're not even aware of what other countries are able to get from the IMF. 
compared to what, let's say, you were able to negotiate. So I, I know that when Martin Guzman was talking uh, to Sri Lankans, they were surprised at the extent to which he had been able to negotiate something different from what is being forced down them. I think that the fact that finance ministers or governments of debtor countries are forced to go individually to the groups of creditors. And so, you know, they are the bad people, the bad children in the room being sort of in, being disciplined by the creditors. That's the, the, the wrong way to do it. And really uh, the only way to get some kind of a stronger voice in the international arena, I think is to combine. It's clearly not going to happen otherwise. You have to make yourself systemically important. And it can be done. I don't think it's impossible. On the issue of the private creditors, and here I think I want to add to Nyambura's question, what do we do about organizing? And I think really we have to think about coalitions. I mean, Linda and my colleague Nancy Fulbray has this wonderful phrase, necessity is the mother of coalitions. And we really do have to think of different kinds of coalitions. It's very um, evident in the case of private creditors because a lot of the problem of private creditors can be addressed if there is good legislation in the global north. 95% of sovereign debt contracts are in New York or London. And at this moment, as we speak, there is legislation that has been brought by some senator, uh, by some people in the New York legislature to actually force private creditors to accept the deals post facto, not, in, not just for new, uh, collective action clause type debts, but for the earlier debts. If that succeeds, that would be a huge thing because it means that you cannot have the holdout creditors destroying your possibilities and you don't have to go and negotiate individually with every single one of them. So we have to be working with people there. We have to be thinking of all the different kinds of coalitions we can have. Uh, you know, uh, you meant that all these different groups who are affected. And so if you can think of all the different groups and across countries and across regions, I mean, coalitions is absolutely critical for us because we are facing very big powers and we're facing very influential and, and uh, determined powers. So we really have to think of every possible way in that sense. I want to come to a question that um, Carolyn has raised in the, in the online uh, Q&A. She said, all of you spoke to commercial financials, Carolyn Hossein, that is, who only care about retaining a commercial financial system. What's happening with public finance? Africa and the Caribbean have a rich history of member-owned and cooperative banks. Where are we on having more of those kinds of banks in our world? So in fact, that's it's an absolutely important and crucial point because we are in a world where there are public banks playing very important roles in many countries. It's not just in... Africa and the Caribbean, in, in Thailand, at the moment I'm speaking from Thailand, in Thailand there is a history of cooperative banks and public banks. Vietnam, it's a very strong role of public banks. Actually, even in India, there was a tradition of development banking which we killed, but it is still possible to retain. And there is so much that can be done with public banks. The World Bank, let us remind ourselves, is paid for by all of our money. It is, in fact, a public bank. It doesn't behave that way. It behaves as if it's protecting the interests of large capital, but it is actually funded by taxpayers across the world. So we should force it to behave like a public bank as well. Um, and um, finally, Tamasina asked, what could transformative adaptation mean? You know, we have so many good proposals and suggestions coming from so many different say. I have put in the chat uh, of the online thing, the UN Women brought out a uh, feminist plan for a post-COVID recovery, which I think is very good. I've been part of two international uh, commissions which have brought out reports recently. One is the World, the, um, the um, WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All, where we brought out a report suggesting what countries can and should do and what the multilateral system can and should do. It was an all woman council, by the way, which was also a, a nice um, uh, thing to have. Um, the, there is a report to the UN Secretary General on effective multilateralism, which is making a whole lot of excellent suggestions. The Secretary General himself has come up with a really good position paper on multilateral finance. 
and on, on the international financial architecture. So there's no shortage of proposals, really good ones and doable, viable ideas. The, the, the problem is how do we translate those into determined action? They're not being done because let's face it, the power imbalances are too strong. The empire strikes back, it doesn't allow us to happen. So we have to think of ways to change that power balance. We know they are very powerful. We know that global capital can lobby with governments and more or less get its way. The only way to confront that is with much greater power of people, which means we have no choice but coordinating and, co and joining coalitions. Thank you, Bastani. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, Nyambura's question is very challenging. Um, uh, how do we build? You know what happens? What? What? How do we build movements around this? These issues. I'm not the expert of that, but. You know, when I started looking at issues of climate finance, it it seemed really different. Like I looked at it and I was like, oh, climate finance, what is specific about this? And then when you read, you're like, oh, this is the model of the 90s. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same old shit. And and it's the kind of nonsense sorry that that a lot of coalitions have built around there have been a lot of coalitions lots of movement building lots of successes lots of failures but lots of successes and i think there's the in knowing that and in understanding that there's the opportunity of what jrg says of coalitions because when i think about the climate movement it's been that the climate movement but there are a range of other social justice movements that are under the same, as you say, capitalist system, in which this model of PPPs, commodification, all of that fall under. So it's, a, it's around connecting these struggles. I think that, that there is the work that needs to be done on that. Um, JRT speaks about... Um, Alternatives, they are alternatives, but how well translated is that on the ground? Um, I'm not sure of that, to be honest. Like, do, do our, our, I think our demands are, are clear, but like in terms of them being actionable, you know, have we done that work? That struggle, that, that, that takes real effort, which, which is not just with movements, but it's with academics. It's with a whole coalition and network of things. Um, and that still needs to be built around, uh, you know, within that. So, um, and then, and, and, and the reason why that is important is to push for what um, Togo you want, which is like, what, what does this transformative, uh, adaptation plan that can look, what does that look like? For me, I think it, it falls on macro, like what kind of macroeconomic framework should we be pushing for, right? And for that, it's one that has a broader mandate that ensures that yes, we have environmental justice, employment, we, we're not just focused on inflation targeting, right? We've got a broader macroeconomic framework that ensures that, you know, um, that supports a green industrial policy, that supports environmental justice, that supports a, 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 a green industrial policy that can also create decent work. These things need to be part of a macroeconomic framework. And how does that translate into then the monetary policy instruments that you then end up using, right? Because then you do what JRT mentioned. You know, JRT says there are these public banks, and I think it was Karen yes, um, saying that there are there are these public banks. The public bank doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to do good things, right? It doesn't mean these are highly contested institutions. 
that even if you give them a mandate, such as in our public bank, the, the, uh, the Industrial Development Corporation, whose mandate it is, is to industrialize, let's just say, right? That's its mandate. But like, let's put it crudely in that way. That bank has that mandate, but it hasn't been able to develop, deliver that mandate. Why? Because where does it get its money from? Not from the state. The state has been austere. It gets its money from capital markets that then dictate, and because of that, the interest rates are higher than what it then can concession out. So then it, it acts like a commercial bank. And then when you look at where it has been giving its money, yes, it's two renewables, right, which is great, to the IPPs. However, it has neglected to also think about, okay, how do we localize the renewables? How do we create jobs? Because we know that uh, they, 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 they might be job losses when we, we, you know, in the transition. So how do we ensure that we have these value chains? So we start, we, we're not just about primary commodities, right? How do we ensure that we have this, uh, um, uh, these value chains that are created to absorb employment? But if you don't have a macroeconomic framework that says that is a mandate, then it, you know, that forces then these banks uh, to, to, uh, to channel financing in a particular way, then you're not going to have it. That happened during apartheid. In apartheid, the central bank gave the, the, these other commercial banks, sorry to say I'm not glorifying it, but I'm just stating facts here. It, 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 it said, we want to industrialize. Of course, in our case, green, right? Uh, 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 like, and you can only finance this type of sector. You can only, so you, you get, you know, you force it. That happened in East Asia, you force it. That's not what happens, what's happening within the current global financial architecture. So yes, there are instruments, there is innovation that can happen, but it's not being actually utilized, right? In order for us to have some kind of a Green New Deal. Um, but then it falls back on on Yumbura's question around how do we how do we push for that to happen? Um, uh, uh, what what needs to happen in 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 the kinds of mobilizations that demand for that um, uh, to happen? Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, Ju, he is the organizer, <laughs> the real power here, actually, who's done this wonderful job of bringing all of us together. She's telling me time's up, time's up. Um, so uh, I want to thank our three panelists um, for doing a great job. A brilliant job, in fact. And thank all of you for being here. And also, once again, the Institute of Economic Justice, IFE, of which I'm actually a board member, which I forgot to mention to you all, and ideas for bringing, up, bringing this event together. Really, I think a great end, hopefully, to the Feminist Economic School and a great start to tomorrow, the larger conference. Thanks a lot. <laughs>